Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Claire Barnett. I'm Executive Director of Healthy Schools Network. And uh, before I get started, I would just like a quick show of hands. This is a three-question survey, um, if you don't mind, which is my context, uh, as opposed to the context of this morning. For show of hands, how many of you here in the room attended public schools through high school? Fabulous. How many of you have children in your families who attended public school through high school? Not as many. How many of you have a child in your own family or a neighboring family whom you know is able to do all his, his or her seat work at home easily, quickly, pays attention, follows directions and so forth, but seems to be confused and underperforming at school? Anybody know that? It actually happens a lot. So let's keep moving here. And I click this and it moves to the right. To the right. Good. So we look at schools through two frames. And this is really a collision of very interesting problems here. And so the most fun happens in between two silos, as you know. Um, the first frame, which I hope you'll take away, is that children are not just little adults. The second is that schools aren't just little offices. We're dealing with very different kinds of situations. So let's look at children are not little adults. Children are biologically uniquely vulnerable to environmental health hazards. They breathe more air per pound of body weight. Their skin is more permeable. They eat and drink more food and liquid than adults. They also may have very different exposures. They sit, they sit on the floor. They play on the floor. They may engage in hand to mouth behavior. So if you think of a small classroom and lots of small kids sitting on an old dirty carpeting, what are they taking in? Lots of dust, lots of everything that's been tracked in. So they have different behaviors that put them as, at risk as well. They also are not able to identify hazards. They are not able to articulate what might be possible exposure, so they can't really tell you reliably what's happening or what it feels like. There's also no school exposure data anywhere out there in the country. There is no reporting, monitoring, or interventions for children who may be at risk or who have suspected exposures in the K-12 environment as well as childcare environments which then makes, deprives everybody of a research base. Children obviously don't have contracts or bargaining rights either. So the question here is, wouldn't better d data drive better design? If you really knew what was happening to children, wouldn't that drive better design? It might. Um, I'll give you one, one current example is asthma absenteeism. Uh, asthma is the leading cause of school absenteeism among children but it also happens to be on NIOSH studies, the leading work-related disease in, among teachers and school custodians. In other words, they get it on the job. Let's talk a little bit about schools are not just little offices. Um, there is very inconsistent state and local funding on school buildings. Um, probably most of you know that constitutionally education is left to the states. All states compel children to attend schools. The volunteer boards of public schools as well as private are the, are the owners. Uh, schools or buildings are more densely occupied. They have more chemical products and uses taking place than a normal office would. Uh, they have a record, a long documented long record, of poor maintenance and repair. 95% of all school occupants are women and children, and many of those women are of childbearing age. So you have these buildings that nobody's really paying attention to or not funding well, and there's no oversight and there's no tracking. Uh, housing on a regular workday basis, 30, 40 or more hours a week, two of the most vulnerable, uh, biologically vulnerable subsets of the population. And I want to raise a question here about ASHRAE, which many years ago, 30 some odd years ago, established that through some, accepted some uh, studies indicating that 80% satisfaction of adults in a workplace of indoor air meant that you had satisfactory indoor air quality. You cannot possibly apply that to schools because more than 80% of the occupants are children and they can't express that, that uh, satisfaction. So we regard all school children should be considered at elevated risk of health and learning difficulties just due to the conditions of their building. And this is a, a large national report, triennial report. It's a free download on our website. 
it looks like this, and it's sitting on the home page if any of you are interested, but it's an analysis state by state with uh, some footnoted narrative. So what are we looking for in terms of school design? The Institute of Medicine in its climate report in 2011 said that indoor exposures were already damaging health and learning. They also said indoor exposures were roughly 100 to 1,000 times more intense than outdoor exposures, that climate change is expected to make indoor exposures worse. Importantly, they said there is sufficient evidence today to prevent exposures. So I want to be careful about the research question of let's not let more research stand in the way of doing the prevention that we know how to do. It also said that green buildings and products are not always the answer. And that's because of how traditional green buildings have been built in the past and how some measures of green, of green products were used. Another great report was the National Research Council report in 2006 on green, green schools attributes for health and learning. Uh, but basically, they found that at that point, there was a robust literature, robust published literature, on health and learning attributes in indoor environments. They needed to be clean, dry, quiet, control dust and particulates, and have good door air. Let's think about that. Clean, dry, quiet. It sounds wonderful. Greg Katz, in 2006, did a terrific report, and I uh, picked up the uh, link to this uh, from the U.S. Green Building site, uh, is that occupant health savings actually outweigh all the conservation efforts by a very significant margin. But let's do a reality check. In the U.S. today, there are about 100,000 public school buildings and another 30,000 private and 50 million children roughly in those public schools. So let's do a reality check of 100,000 existing buildings. How are people actually using the buildings? How are they taking care of them and so forth? So I'll flip through these quickly. Um, and just, you know, it's a closed ventilation, bad custodial closet, mold contamination, lead moisture, PCBs, legacy toxics in the buildings. This is another way that buildings get used. Chemical mismanagement, a hoarder classroom, water fountain shut off, mold contamination, that happens to be a kindergarten cubby in a occupied school building in Philadelphia. Does green design help? How can you do clean, dry, quiet, have thermal comfort and dust? You can do that with a lot of green design. You can also do that with a lot of healthy design. Can you keep pollution and dirt out? That's siting, idling, loading, walkaways, entry walk-offs. Can you make cleaning easier? That's locating the custodial closet where the messes are with storage for tools and equipment. Can the in-house staff keep the building clean and in good repair? That's training and equipment. Does the design standard recognize and help schools comply with existing regulations, for example, say for pest control? And down here are three little pictures. I'm sorry, the center one's a little hard to see. On the lower left is a custodial cleaning area. Um, is that going to help keep dirt out? Is that a good-looking custodial closet? Is it near the messes? Probably not. It's in the basement. The center picture is a a uh, school that I took a tour of that happens to have a koi pond in the entryway. And when you think about clean, dry, and quiet, you're not necessarily thinking about installing a koi pond in the front entry of a school building. And on the lower right is keeping pests out of buildings. Now, the problem with this picture here is that the landscape plannings go straight up to the foundation, which then provides animal access to the foundation of the building. So of these three, which ones are in a certified green building, or a certified green high-performance building. It turns out all of them are. So we have, the, we have the information on what not to do. Um, so my wrap-up here is there's more information that we provide to a lot of stakeholders across the country, and many of our partners through the National Coalition for Healthier Schools, which my office coordinates, we engage with um, literally um, about 150 different organizations um, representing about 15 to 20 million um, Americans. Uh, we run a website, our own, which is healthyschools.org. We also have a shared website, Cleaning for Healthy Schools, which is both green products, healthy green products, and other healthy products for schools, relying on third-party certification, which I didn't hear a lot of during the EPD and HPD conversations. 
We also coordinate and have for many, many years in partnership with EPA and CDC something called National Healthy Schools Day, which is coming up on April 7th. So please join us for National Healthy Schools Day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.